Hi there, welcome to class today. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, caring for gay, lesbian, and trans youth today. And uh, we're going to probably have about 20 minute conversation, 15 or 20 minute conversation on that, that very complicated topic. Um, so start out thinking about Jason and Alice, parents of a 21 year old who telephone you and ask that they want to discuss their child. They describe themselves as devout Christians who've not seen their child in more than a year because they've not been able to accept their child's gender identity. How can we as good, good Christians embrace a trans child, they ask. You agree to meet with them the following week. Um, as you meet with them uh, in your office for the first time, you shake hands, invite them in, and then ask them to tell you more about their child. Our child used to be called Robert, uh, Alice says, but for the past year or so, he's insisted on being called Ella. I don't know what we did wrong in raising our, our son to want to be a woman. Maybe it's something he picked up on the internet. We've always been a solid, faithful Christian family, but we don't know how to accept my son as a woman. Jason continues, I do want to love and accept my son, but I don't know how to begin. He's lucky to be in a liberal arts college environment where he's, he's accepted as a she. To be honest, I'm relieved that our child no longer comes home to visit for visits and attends church with us. I mean, what should we say to other people? How could we explain to the minister that our son is now a daughter? As you assess Jason and Alice's situation during your first pastoral care visit with them, you know because of your experience that uh, the acceptance of a trans child um, unconditional acceptance by their parents is one of the most important factors that prevents uh, suicide, self-harm, and addiction. Um, and so your struggle is going to help them feel like what they're going through is normal. Um, and you want to give positive education about trans people. And so you suggest a support group and suggest that um, they begin learning about uh, what it means to be a, a trans kid. In your second pastoral care session with them, you learn that they desperately do want to accept their child and her transgender identity, but they don't see how they can reconcile their acceptance with the Christian faith. Doesn't God decide before we're born whether or not we're male or female? Alice asks at one point. Jordan adds, I've always been taught that God doesn't make mistakes in making us who he wants us to be. You invite Jordan to read and pray about, Jordan and Alice to read and pray about passages in the New Testament. Matthew 19, 11 through 12, Acts 8, 25 through 39, and Galatians 3, 21. These biblical references provide important messages of affirmation for trans people um, because they call on us to reevaluate um, our understandings of gender variance in the light of our faith. It's drawing on Justin Tannis's exegesis of these three passages, you explore with Jordan and Alex what it might mean for uh, their child would be a eunuch for the kingdom. And you call for them to accept transgender children as children of God. And you talk a little bit about some of your own journey of faith around this issue, trying to understand and accept um, God's beautiful diversity in uh, creating a variety of genders and gender expressions. That was Jason and Alex and their struggle to accept their trans child, Ella, Damon, Claire, and Abby, building support for a queer family in a community of faith. Damon's the only child of Claire and Abby, now nine years old and in fourth grade, about to enter your youth group. Uh, he recently came home from Sunday school upset because two children had called his, son, his mom's dykes and lesbos. After working successfully with their son's Sunday school teacher on ways to address the issue of teasing, Claire and Abby decided to begin a conversation with you the pastor at their church, about making the congregation a more welcoming place for children of LGBTQ parents. You say that you're eager to help educate the entire congregation about ways to welcome families with gay and lesbian parents. In your first meeting with Claire and Abby, you talked to them about some ways that they might work with the church leadership to build a congregation which welcomes and affirms all children, including those with LGBTQ parents. Claire and Abby have been active for a few years in a local chapter of the Children of Lesbians and Gays Everywhere, Collage. And they believe that their experience as effective advocates for children 
of queer parents in the local school system has prepared them to help foster this environment in your church. You suggest some new education, uh, welcoming types of uh, sex education, uh, such as that offered by the United Church of Christ. Um, and the UU also has a powerful program that's very affirming. Um, so you invite your church into a, a journey together of lifelong religious education, um, the Our, Our Whole Lives curriculum, which is a comprehensive sex education for the entire church. So for Damon, Claire, and Abby, Damon's bullying is not tied to his own identity, but to his um, identity as being the child of uh, a lesbian uh, couple who uh, are, are seeking in their own way uh, to completely fulfill their vocation as a Christian family. And they want the church to be uh, partner, partnering with them in this. So today, um, we're in the middle of a complicated new terrain of... Um, new understandings of sexuality and identity. And you might find yourself kind of only halfway there, um, or maybe not even that. Um, we've had the, the topic introduced by uh, uh, the Dykstra chapter on Bobby Griffith and that uh, loss by suicide in his book, Counseling Troubled Youth. But I think that any, any pastoral care that's wise uh, will need to work on welcoming LGBTQ youth into their community, as well as um, other forms of uh, sexuality and gender identity. This is really important because LGBTQ youth are more likely to face bullying and are more likely to face uh, mental problems as a result. And they're just as likely um, as any other kid in your youth group to shine the image of God in their lives to the rest of the world. And so uh, dangerous and risky adolescence for LGBTQ youth is partly because of the environments that they find themselves. And sometimes one of the tragedies I've noticed is that our Christian environments contribute just as much um, to this marginalization. Um, so I would say it's important to learn um, to help families with, with gay, uh, gay and lesbian and trans kids um, who are increasingly coming out early and almost always know their orientation um, or their gender identity. And uh, helping them to prevent bullying, um, sometimes that means kind of creating a support group in your youth group. Um, so unsurprisingly, su suicide is two to three times more likely in among LGBTQ youth, Q youth um, with 25% of lesbians and 20% of gays having made a suicide attempt at some point. Um, so suicide risk, uh, it's a complicated topic that we're going to talk about a, li a little bit more, should be taken seriously, and a contract should be made up um, for caring for kids so that they uh, feel like they have several people they can reach out to. Um, but being queer, being LGBTQ, queer is just a new word for that, um, being queer is about more than just sexuality, but it involves all parts of one's life. And gay and lesbian kids are looking for all the things that kids are looking for everywhere. Those um, transferences we talked about from Dykstra, the mirroring, idealizing, and twinship identifications um, are just as present in kids who are gay and lesbian as they look for role models, as they look for mentors in, in, your, in the care that you provide. They're seeking uh, to know that they're loved just as they are and that God loves them equally. So that's the, that's the recent book by e the evangelical author Jeffrey Chu, Does, God, Does Jesus Love Me?, where he goes around and asks um, conservative Christians really all over the country about uh, their experiences with gays and lesbians. And he's uh, seeking an answer in that, in that book about the question of whether Jesus loves him. So now let's turn to Stonefish and Harvey. In their book, uh, Nurturing Queer Youth, um, there's, there's really so many new books about adolescents and who are gay and lesbian that this was a difficult choice to make on just one. But I chose this book, Nurturing Queer Youth, which um, if you've had much experience, I just encourage you to take a look at the whole book. And this uh, chapter is uh, called Difficult Conversations. 
and it has to do with a difficult dialogue uh, between queer youth and their families who might be on the whole spectrum of acceptance. And another book I would recommend for you on this topic is called Mom, I'm Gay by Susan Cottrell, who uh, is an evangelical author who went through this experience twice with two different, uh, two different children. And she talks about her own spiritual journey of coming to accept her, her children's sexual orientation, um, not as a result of sin or as a result of abuse, but really as an expression of the full grace of God in human life. Um, I tend to think about the range of which, the range of ways in which we express our sexuality and sexual orientation and gender identity as being all about our life under grace. And the more we learn about science, um, the more we see that God's diversity is a big part of God's gift of creation, gift to creation. Um, so um, Stonefish and Harvey talk about some ways um, to help adolescents have difficult conversations with their family. And in some ways, these conversations echo a lot of what we've learned about from Siegel and others. Um, adolescents tend to kind of prepare their families for hearing what they're going to hear. And uh, maybe if you've helped a kid come out to their family, you understand this journey. Um, they also tend to try to shield their parents from the truth if, if they believe their parents may not be able to accept something. Um, also, sometimes uh, Stonefish and Harvey talk about how sometimes parents will get preoccupied around the issue of suicide risk. But the whole therapeutic aim is to help a family try to understand one another and have a deeper relationship with one another than they have had before. Um, so the therapeutic approach really tries to help families not be disrespectful of one another, but come to understand one another. And um, the, really the emphasis is on acceptance versus rejection, because just how powerful Ex full acceptance of a gay and lesbian child is um, a uh, teenager or adolescent or someone who has um, is trans a trans kid um, they really have a, a keenly tuned filter to whether their parents are accepting of them and so they're paying attention to that let me just do a couple of um, quick definitions um, so in case these are new terms for you LGBTQ refers to the uh, to lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans and queer persons. Um, the IA uh, has to do with um, intersex is I, so people who have uh, anatomical, um, who are anatomically both sexes to some extent, and um, A would be. Uh, asexual. Okay, so there's uh, an increasing number of folks who are asexual and who express no sexuality, but that's not the result of pathology. It really seems to be the, the way that they're made, um, the way that their life under grace works out. So queer, um, keep hanging in with me here, and uh, we'll get to some of the payoff pastorally too. So queer is a broad term that, uh, ref that can include all the categories of people who are, whose sexuality or expression are not normative. Um, sometimes this this is expressed as gender queer, which can refer to someone who has identifies with uh, traits of both male and female. Um, lesbian refers to female persons who are primarily or exclusively attracted to other female persons. Um, gay or gay man refers to male persons who are primarily or exclusively attracted to other male persons. Sometimes gay is used in a broader sense to mean both le lesbian and gay and all LGBTQ people. So I've heard orientation described this way. Um, like, what's your fantasy life? If you were going to picture rushing into a burning building and rescuing someone, um, what gender would that person be? And uh, some people say that's a good way of talking about kind of orientation. Um, so bisexual refers to male or female persons who are attracted to both same sex and other sex persons, though not necessarily to the same degree, and sometimes this is shortened to bi. Transgender is a broad term to include those who, who are both contravening the normally accepted definitions of gender all or part of the time, often, a short, 
often is shortened to trans. And it's really important to note that not everybody who's trans wants to get uh, the, the gender reassignment surgery. Um, so there, and so there's not always that path uh, to gender reassignment. Um, and it's important to emphasize trans is different than just cross-dressing, which uh, some people do without um, completely feeling like they're another gender. So trans is that mi mismatch between one's bio uh, biological anatomy and, and the gender that really one really feels one is, kind of at a gut level. And it's not something that anybody, anybody chooses, and um, it's not something they just pick up on by being influenced by the Internet. And it doesn't influence um, their, the quality of their life before God. It doesn't mean that they're mentally ill. In fact, when they're given a chance to express themselves, trans people have no psychological problems. It's uh, the oppression that comes from a society where you don't have your gender allowed that really causes the mental health difficulties that you see among many trans individuals. Um, to come out of the closet means to declare in some public way, widely or narrowly, one's sexual orientation and or gender identity. And so somebody might have done this to some extent in one space, but then in another space they haven't come out. And so you might, um, unless you have a really accepting church, you might end up being a space where people haven't come out yet. And uh, so in evaluating your church, you might be thinking about um, whether or not you want to be a part of Kids who come might be thinking about whether they want to be a part of a congregation if it doesn't already have a reputation of being welcoming, if that makes sense. So I've heard about recently about evangelical churches who, where uh, evangelically oriented mainline churches where people, um, young people won't come for confirmation because of the church's historical stance on uh, whether they accept gay or lesbians or whether they perform weddings for gays and lesbians, those kinds of things. Um, so kids in the neighborhood will know about your church's reputation, about whether or not you're a welcoming place. And that will be part of the, the uh, pastoral care that you're doing as you're um, en engaging this space with young people. So sexual orientation really refers to, uh, to a person's innate sense of emotional, romantic, and or erotic attraction to others as opposed to sexual preference, which implies a conscious choice. Um, so again, sexual orientation is really a matter of fantasy, and you find it's really hardwired, um, and there's a spectrum of sexual orientation. It's not as if someone is all straight or all gay, but, but there's a great deal of variation in between, um, people who kind of have fantasies of, uh, both male and female attraction across the spectrum, and that doesn't mean that they're, uh, gay necessarily, but it some, there's a range of people, and the, the terms gay and straight, the terms uh, straight, gay, and lesbian don't seem to adequately cover the range of ways people experience their sexual attraction to one another. And then sexual identity, ref, or gender identity, refers to the gender that one knows oneself to be. So um, right away, I would say, um, I just want you to be thinking about some of the helpful and unhelpful messages that young, young people get from the church. Um, I think some of the unhelpful messages are things like, uh, keep quiet about who you really are because our church can't handle it. Um, so, uh, hold, hold yourself kind of, uh, at a distance or some parts of yourself quiet, uh, until our church can get our political problem sorted out. It's just too much trouble, uh, to handle who you are and your identity. And that kind of creates a what Dykstra calls an abandonment depression at the heart of uh, gay and lesbian young people who might feel like, um, am I completely loved by God because this church um, doesn't accept me or understand me? Or it could just create a kind of despair of ever finding a really welcoming uh, religious community. It's no wonder uh, to me, and so... So, so I think what we might be missing out on as a church is the real witness of gay and lesbian teens who are deep people of faith and who want to find a way to integrate their faith and their gender experience and, their, and being trans into what it means to be disciples. And because we've excluded them in these explicit or implicit ways, um, they're going to other communities to find support. 
And the church, as a result, is missing out on the on their distinctive form of witness, which is kind of, which is the distinctive witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that means, in a sense, that the church doesn't become as fully the church that God calls it to be, because it misses out on the witness and the history of particular LGBTQ youth who want to want to contribute and want to contribute to the life of faith. But in the face of that, there is this breaking in of Christ's hope, the eschatological self that Dykstra talks about. The Adventus keeps coming in the lives of gay and lesbian teens and t trans teens as they support one another, as they create uh, places where they can uh, find shared understanding. Um, sometimes that's a local religious congregation that's waving a, an LGBTQ flag outside. Um, sometimes it's LGBTQ youth centers, community centers. Um, one particular concern that we're facing is a lot of, of queer teens end up on the street, um, especially from families uh, who have been minoritized, African American and uh, Latinx families, other families. Um, so they can end up in situations where they need a lot of support and protection um, from community centers. Uh, denominational LGBTQ caucuses, so in the Presbyterian Church, places like uh, More Light um, and Covenant Network of Presbyterians are places where um, gay and lesbian Christian identity is in the foreground. Um, gay straight alliances at school, they found that gay, having a gay straight alliance um, can increase the level of safety for all students at the school. Um, queer social clubs, the Human Rights Campaign Coming Out Project, PFLAG, Out and Equal in the work, Workplace, Coming Out Stories, Archive on the Logo TV Network, and online discussion and chat groups and email discussion lists for LGBTQ people of faith. So I really encourage you not to work alone in this area, especially if it's new for you. And if you're finding yourself just kind of slowly moving from a more punitive approach um, or a rejecting approach on the basis of your faith to one that's more accepting, if you find yourself somewhere on that journey, I encourage you to partner with people who can be um, supports and a little bit farther along and who may themselves be a little more secure in their gay and lesbian identity so that you can help build a sense of community um, and so that you can increase um, the network of a particular gay and lesbian teen, especially if kind of the only places that they have are uh, closeted places around them. Well, I really encourage you in this area of ministry not to ask anybody to sacri sacrifice their sexuality for the sake of their faith, because that's really a false choice. Um, Jesus Christ came to be a liberator and bring a freedom from bondage, and one of the areas that many teens who are gay and lesbian and trans have struggled with bondage is around uh, feeling fully accepted and known in their identity. And you can be a place um, in a variety of outward or implicit ways. Um, sometimes it's wearing a rainbow sticker uh, or a rainbow pin. Sometimes it's more subtle references that you drop in the youth group or in other places that are going to signal to young people that you're a safe person to talk to and that they can come to you and uh, share their own journey. And my, I just guarantee that that's already happened for you and your youth group, or it's going to happen in the next few years as this becomes more and more a part of, of your identity and who you are. Um, so we'll, we'll pause the discussion there, and I hope you're thinking of some questions and a conversation we can have about this important topic. Um, it's something that I've changed a lot on c growing up in an evangelical context myself, and um, slowly hearing the stories of uh, gay and lesbian friends in seminary and also people that I cared for in different um, healthcare settings and other settings uh, that shared with me their own story. And what strikes me about those stories is how important religious communities are that are welcoming and how if you uh, people who are Christians and gay or lesbian or trans um, often struggle to find a Christian community that's supportive and so I encourage you to work, even if it involves some personal risk for yourself, um, to work to make the places that you worship and the places uh, where your identity is shaped as a Christian more welcoming uh, for gays and lesbians and queer teens in your youth group. Um, because I think what's happening now 
is a real uh, transformation of the church um, in relationship to these stories. So my prayers go with you as you face this new dimension of ministry um, and as you bring yourself uh, more fully into your ministry with gay and lesbian and trans kids. Okay, God bless you.